That's better. All right. Good day, everyone. Welcome along. Um, okay, so I have around about 25 or 26 speaking presentations in the stable in my repertoire, but I have to say that this one is by far the most difficult one for me to deliver. And for that reason, over the years, I've avoided delivering it at all. In fact, over six years, I've probably only delivered this presentation five or six times. But as you'll hear, um, Quite recently, sorry, we made a promise to some very special people and we fully intend to honour that promise. So we first heard about the, the Penley lifeboat disaster back in 2017 when we first went to Southampton in England to pick up our boat for the first time which was going to become our home. And when I heard the story I thought this would make a really good presentation. So I did some research into it and I built up a presentation and that um, presentation lasted about 20 minutes. So I combined it with a couple of other presentations, short stories about some of my other um, personal heroes and I called that presentation Unknown Heroes. But whenever I went to present it, uh, I became emotionally involved in that presentation and it was very, very difficult um, to present. Don't know why, had no idea why. It, um, get, I get that way. But um, there's a couple of different theories about it. Um, my theory is that this is a tragic story, but I mean, there's lots of tragic stories out there. But um, this is something that's happened during our lifetime. In fact, only 41 years ago. And there's a couple of other complications or com um, things that add to that as well. For, for many, many years, right up until she passed away, my mum was a volunteer with the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard. She was a radio operator with, with the Coast Guard. And uh, Leanne and I are still currently serving officers with the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard. Lee's a qualified rescue boat crew person and I'm a, a, uh, a rescue boat helmsman. Uh, we're both commercially qualified radio operators. And at the moment, we hold the status of roving ambassadors for the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard, which is the equivalent of the RNLI or the Royal National Lifeboat Institute in England. And just to explain that these organisations are voluntary organisations. Uh, we have to raise our, our own funds and we don't have a Coast Guard in Australia or England. These are the organisations that uh, go out and uh, uh, help people when they're in, in, uh, in problems or uh, search and rescue operations. And I suppose the closest thing you have in the US is the US Coast Guard Auxiliary, uh, which was uh, uh, the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard is based upon. Um, but as I said, Lee, uh, that's one theory. Lee's theory, on the other hand, is I'm just a big sook and I should harden up. So it's, <laughs> it's great having that support from your wife. <laughs> Someone told me. But this is the story of the MV Union Star. It starts with the Union Star. And this is a typical coastal freighter, what's known as a coaster. And there's thousands and thousands of these all around the world. They're very standard. They're the Labradors of the, of the sea. Uh, you see, you've probably seen lots of these as you've cruised around around the world. They don't cross oceans like we're doing now, but they do all the coastal trade along um, continents, especially throughout Europe, uh, Africa, and Asia. And the Union Star was built in Denmark and it was on, it's at 70 meters by 11 meters. It has two engines which drive one propeller. It was on its maiden voyage. It was going to Rotterdam to pick up some fertilizer in Rotterdam and it was taking that fertilizer to Ireland because that's exactly what they need in Ireland, more fertilizer. <laughs> It had a crew of, of five men under the command of Captain Henry Morton. But Mr. Captain Morton made a secret, unscheduled and unauthorised stop on the coast of England to pick up his wife and two teenage stepdaughters. Um, his stepdaughters lived in South Africa with their father. They wanted to spend Chris as much time uh, at as possible. They only had a short amount of time in England over the school holidays and they wanted to maximise that time. So he made this unauthorised stop to pick them up so they could spend Christmas together because this was only happened a week before Christmas. So in total there were eight souls on board the Union Star but what didn't come out in the inquiry, what uh, we found recently found out is that Mrs Morton herself was pregnant. Um, so really one more 
Now their plan was to come through the Netherlands, through the English Channel and go what is referred to as around the, the corner of Land's End. And that's called the corner because it's uh, the most uh, southwestern part of England, go around there into the Irish Sea. And this will give you a little bit better idea of, uh, of Land's End over on the left hand side. And this is this coastline of, uh, of Cornwall. And you see this little place here, this little village? You see that? Can you see what? That's uh, any English people here? If you ever go to uh, if you ever go to Cornwall and you ask for directions to Mouse Hole, I'll have no idea what you're talking about because it's called Mousel. Yeah, go figure. And uh, the, just to give you a, a bit of a scale here, the, the distance between Newland there and Mousel is around about six minutes drive, and one minute drive north of Mousel is Penley Point. The, the um, the, uh, where the Penley lifeboat base was um, uh, stationed. Now, Captain Morton rang his brother uh, during the early afternoon and said everything was going well and they expected to be around the corner into the Irish Sea either late afternoon or early evening. But at 6 o'clock that night, 1800, the Union Star made this call to the uh, Felmouth Coast Guard. Land's in Coast Guard, Land's in Coast Guard. Union Star, Union Star, going Land's End Coast Guard. Union Star, this is Palmer, excuse me, I'm over. Uh, approximately now, eight miles east of Wolf Rock. Uh, engines have stopped, and we are unable to get them started at the moment. So the engines have stopped. Um, they had called the, uh, the Coast Guard on Channel 16, which is the International Distress Frequency. They hadn't issued a Mayday, but uh, Channel 16 is, uh, is monitored by all vessels at sea, including uh, the one that we're on right now. It's part of the Safety of Life at Sea protocols, SOLAS protocols. And another vessel picked up this, uh, this call, and that was the, the, uh, the Nord Holland, which was a salvage tug. And the Nord Holland contacted the Union Star at 1816. And uh, Channel 16 is, is used for distress, but it's also used for initial calls. So they contacted each other on Channel 16, and then they went to a working frequency to have a conversation. And that was conversation was about the Nord Holland offering its tow, offering assistance to the Union Union Star under the Lloyd's Open Letter of Selvage, which is a standard sort of um, selvage document, uh, which means that instead of having a fixed fee uh, to tow someone from location A to a, a, a safe harbour of some sort, uh, whether that be three or four or five thousand pounds, whatever it would be, depending on how far they would have to go, under a Lloyd's Letter of Selvage, the amount of the, um, the compensation or the amount paid to the, the selvage tug is dependent upon a, it goes to a, an independent board in London and they assess the, uh, the, the compensation to be paid based on a number of, uh, of factors, uh, a matrix of factors. And those factors include things like the value of the ship, the value of the cargo, uh, the number of people on board, the likelihood of, of loss or damage of that ship and its cargo, the likelihood of, of uh, injury or death to the people on board. And in this case, with a brand new ship making its maiden voyage, um, this amount could have amounted to tens or even of hundreds of thousands of pounds. And Captain Morton refused the offer of the tow. Um, he, the Coast Guard, later called Captain Morton and asked him if he talked to the un to the, uh, the Nord Holland and Morton replied dismissively, yes I have, they're only interested in money. Now at this point the, um, the, the weather wasn't too bad. Force 5 on the, um, on the, on the um, Beaufort scale which is pretty mild sort of conditions but the barometer was dropping very very quickly and the, uh, the forecast was for a very severe storm that night. Now, the Penley lifeboat at Mousel was put on standby. At the time, the men were uh, adjusting the Christmas lights, the famous Mousel Harbour Christmas lights. 
And these have been operating for years and years and years. And this was a fundraising thing for the RNLI. The local council paid the RNLI to put up these lights and adjust them, uh, uh, replace any globes that might have uh, burnt out or anything like that. And so the men uh, were, were summoned together by their coxswain and they were placed on standby. They went and got their equipment and said goodbye uh, to their, their loved ones and assembled at the lifeboat station. Now, as I said, the conditions were going to get very, very bad. In fact, if you, if you talk to uh, any of the old timers along that coastline, they all tell you this was the, the worst storm in, in living memory, and that's backed up by metallurgical data. You, um, you go to the Met office in England, and they'll tell you this was the very worst storm in the history since r records had ever been kept. It went up to force 12 on the Beaufort scale, which is the highest you can get. And it was hurricane conditions with swells of 60 feet, which are higher than, than the building we're in, the, the room we're in right now, uh, or 18 metres swells. At uh, 1941, Morton reported to the Coast Guard that they'd found water, salt water, in their fuel tanks, uh, and there was no possibility of starting these engines, and they requested assistance. The Coast Guard contacted the Royal Navy, and Rescue 80 was launched under the command of Lieutenant Commander Russell Smith of the United States Navy, who was on exchange to the Royal Navy at the time. And they, they went out to the location of the, the Union Star. By this time, obviously, it's, it's pitch black. They, uh, I, they went out to the Union Star. They made contact with them. Commander Smith said that the Nord Holland was still standing by. And uh, Commander Smith advised them that they were getting closer and closer to the coast. What do you want us to do? And Captain Morton uh, said they're still trying to start these engines. They've, they've got an idea. They might be able to start them. Um, the, he heard, C Commander Smith heard the Nord Holland radio the Union Star saying, this is your last chance. Do you want to tow or not? Because we're not staying out here any longer. And once again, Captain Smith refused the tow. And there's been speculation over the years about why he would do that. Um, now, most certainly, if this had gone to a Lloyd's letter of salvage, they'd be gone to an independent board. They would have found out that his wife and daughters were on this vessel, uh, who, who weren't authorised to be on this vessel. And that could have meant probably would have meant the end of Captain Morton's career. But we just don't know what was going through his mind at the time. And the, and the Nord Holland departed from the scene. Um, Commander Smith kept on radioing, saying, you're getting closer and closer. By this time, they were only two and a half miles off the coast. They drifted in from eight miles to two and a half miles. So Commander Smith was asking for instructions. What do you want us to do? And eventually, this conversation took place. How many people do you plan on transferring? Uh, one woman and two children, are Sorry, say again. One woman and two children, are Sorry, say again. One woman and uh, two children. The crew will remain aboard until uh, until the last of it. Yeah, confirm one woman and two children. Yes, that's correct. Now, this is the very first time that anyone knew. that there was women and children aboard this ship. They, uh, Morden had told the Coast Guard that there was eight people on board, and that's what Rescue 80 uh, had heard as, as well. Um, but they, no one had known that there were women and children on board the vessel. Now, if you read the standard operating procedures or the manuals for any rescue organisation or any first responders, it will tell you that all lives are created equal. But the truth is, in reality, and I can tell you from experience that when women and children are involved, the rescuer takes on an extra burden of responsibility. And that's what happened on this evening. Now, they tried to winch a man down. And can you imagine the, the conditions? I don't know if any of you have been in a helicopter before or especially a military helicopter, but they're not the most stable things in the world at the best of times. And this wasn't the best of times. They were flying in a hurricane. 
Commander Smith had to point the, the Sea King helicopter into this wind. He had to rev the engines up a lot so he'd be able to hold his position into this huge hurricane winds. The, the water was lashing, the rain was lashing against the windscreen. The wipers were going full tilt, but he could hardly see anything out that windscreen. And he also had the salt spray from that wind hitting that windscreen as well. He had um, observation uh, windows below him and he could see out from there, but the, the sea spray was uh, clogging up those windows as well. So he was virtually blind. It was up to one of his men to lean out, the, of the crew member of the helicopter, to lean his head and his upper body out the side of the helicopter in these hurricane winds to warn to be able to warn uh, Commander Smith what was happening and to guide him uh, during the, the the, the next uh, uh, several minutes. Now, Commander Smith has told us that a Sea King helicopter, when it's in a hover position, it's nose up and tail down, rotor tail down. That's just the, the natural state of it. And that made it even more unstable during this, this hurricane, these hurricane conditions. They had to try and lower a man down uh, by a, uh, on a wire down to the deck of the, the Union Star. Now, they shone a spotlight down onto the, the deck of the Union Star. The Union Star was actually able to get their generator going for, for a while and they had their deck lights on. So the ship was quite visible uh, during this time. But you can imagine that everything else around the ship was absolutely inky black. You couldn't see a thing. So when those 60 foot swells came across and lifted this ship up, suddenly lifted this ship up towards the hovering helicopter. Commander Smith on several occasions had to yank back on the yoke of and lift up as quickly as possible as his man who was leaning out the side of the helicopter screamed, uh, climb, climb, climb. And on several occasions, the rotor blades of the helicopter, the, the tail rotors of the helicopter almost hit the superstructure of the ship. It was extremely dangerous. And then you had that man that was hanging down on that wire. He was swinging wildly in these huge winds. Um, he almost hit the superstructure on several occasions. On one occasion, as the, the ship rose, he almost smashed into the side of the ship. It was only because Commander Smith was able to pull up quickly that he missed the uh, smashing into that ship. And on another occasion, he watched as the ship rose up towards him. He was convinced that, that this is it. Um, but once again, Commander Smith was able to, to climb quickly. But um, he... Um, his enduring memory of that night is that he got so close to the wheelhouse on one occasion, he could look across and he could see the lower legs of two people. And one of those, those people was obviously a young woman wearing bright red shoes. And, um, and that memory has lived with him ever since. Now, Commander Smith had to abort the operation. There was absolutely no choice. Um, they couldn't do any more, and the Penley lifeboat was activated. It was under the command of a man by the name of Trevelyan Richards, who was the coxswain. He was already a legend amongst the, um, the RNLI and his local community for the, uh, some of the rescues he'd been involved in in the past. An absolute legend. He uh, collected 12 crew members, um, f nine men who had volunteered uh, to go out on the lifeboat and three men who were going to be the launching party of the vessel. Now remember, these are all unpaid volunteers uh, who just want to serve their community. Most of them were fishermen or retired fishermen. Two of the volunteers were a father and son, Nigel and Neil Brockman. But... Um, Richard said that he wouldn't take two members of the same family out on a night like this and young Neil Brockman at the age of 18 was forced to stay behind. And the lifeboat was launched at 2012, 12 minutes past 8 that night. Now to launch the lifeboat, this is where the lifeboat is held, uh, housed at Penley Point. To launch that lifeboat, it's got to slide down that ramp into the water. This was obviously taken in nice conditions, but as I said before, this was an inky black night, huge storm, uh, hurricane conditions with swells and waves hitting those, those, those rocks behind there. The, the, the launching crew had to wait several agonizing minutes to launch because so that the 
until they could find a window where they could launch because if they launched at the wrong time, the life belt would just be picked up and put back, smashed back on the rock so you can see behind the launching station there. But eventually it was launched. And the lifeboat's name was the Solomon Brown. 14 metres long or 47 feet long. Um, it is just a wooden boat, had a top speed of 9 knots or 17 kilometres an hour. And it got out to the Union Star half an hour after it was launched and by this time the Union Star were only a mile off the coastline. They deployed their anchor trying to stop them from, from drifting any further but that anchor was just dragging, it wasn't stopping them at all uh, and by this time they were coming into shallower waters so instead of these huge swells they were now getting severe breaking storms, waves breaking over the top of the ship. Now. Uh, Commander um, Smith and the crew of Rescue 80 had stood by. They weren't going anywhere. They wanted to provide assistance by providing light um, to the lifeboat. So they stayed above, giving advice and information to the lifeboat crew. At one time, Commander Smith radioed that you're only 300 miles from the coast. And he reported that the 300 yards from, sorry, yards from the coast. And um, he. Um, he said that he could see that the men of the Solomon Brown lined up on the on the deck as they time and time again they went over to the the side of the Union Star and the, the vessel was smashed up against the Union Star. He said he could see the men lined up along the deck trying to hold on to the railings, trying to put ropes through the railings to hold themselves against the deck and they were calling out to the people in the in the wheelhouse to come out, come out to the boat but none of them did and I mean I just couldn't imagine what it would have been like with, within that wheelhouse. Um, I mean you've it would be everyone would have been terrified of course but Mrs Morton and the daughters probably would have been severely seasick as well so there's probably excuses reasons why they weren't able to, to run out to the lifeboat at that time but they kept on going back time and time again trying to hold on to the side of the lifeboat. On one occasion, a huge wave picked up the Solomon Brown and deposited it on the foredeck of the um, of the Union Star. And when that ship rolled, they stayed there for a few seconds. And when the ship rolled again, it slid back into the water. And it's believed that at this time, the propeller of the Solomon Brown was badly damaged because when it was recovered, one of the blades of the propeller was severely bent, which would have made it very, very difficult to uh, steer the vessel and operate, propel the vessel, and which makes what happened afterwards even more remarkable because they kept on going back. Smith reported to them that they were only 10 minutes from the beach and, and they're, now they were operating, they were trying to get through the, 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 the chain from the, um, from the anchor was getting in the way, they tried to manoeuvre the way through there, they had to manoeuvre the way through rocks along the, the coastline there, try and get along the side of the vessel but they kept on going back and on one occasion looking through the spotlight, uh, Commander Smith said uh, that he saw uh, four or five people running out of the the, um, the, un the wheelhouse of the Union Star and jumped down to the Solomon Brown. Now by this time in the helicopter, they had had proximity alarms, collision alarms going off because they'd been so close to the Union Star. Now those alarms were going off again because they were now so close to the cliffs behind them. They were trying to shine their lights on and were, the, the tail rotors were getting too close to the cliffs. But there was other problems as well because that salt spray that, that from this hurricane uh, was getting into the fuel in air, the air intake valves of the engines and the engines were showing that they were overheating so Commander Smith had to say we've got to leave we've got to go back to base and uh, he and uh, Rescue 80 headed back to their base and about 30 seconds after they left Commander Smith heard a radio call saying we've got four off we've got four off and they went on to, and Commander Smith remembers just looking across at his co-pilot and shaking their heads in wonder about how they had done that. Th there was a radio call a few seconds later saying, we've got four off, we're going back for the other two. Now, everyone knew there was eight people on board, they'd got four off, they're going back for the other two, that's only six. Um, so there was a bit of confusion. So the Coast Guard radioed up, Penley lifeboat, Penley lifeboat, to try and get clarification. But they didn't get a response, and they never would. 
the next morning the um, the wreckage of the the Union Star was found washed up on the rocks along that Cornish coastline uh, the almost brand new propeller was was shining in the weak uh, English sunlight the largest part of the Solomon Brown that was found wasn't much bigger than this podium and all 16 people on board uh, the, the two vessels uh, perished that night now over the next few days uh, what happened Commander Smith got back to their base they immediately hosed out their air intake valves they took on more fuel and they went back and they searched all through the night uh, for survivors to no avail but um, over the next few days only eight bodies of the 16 were found four from the Solomon Brown four from the Union Star and on Christmas Eve um, the heartbroken village of Mausel buried two of their heroes and they buried the other two on Boxing Day at the inquiry Commander Smith said that the actions by the, the lifeboat and their crew that he had seen were the greatest acts of courage that I've ever seen and I'm ever likely to see now some good did come out of this uh, there was an inquiry into what had happened and, and there was actions taken Rule, laws were changed and this these laws are called the legacy of the Solomon Brown um, the Coast Guard is no longer passive they can issue a mayday on behalf of a vessel and they can also order the captain to take on a tow or to abandon ship and it said that the legacy of the Solomon Brown has saved hundreds of lives over the last 40 years young Neil um, Neil Brookman Brockman um, he stayed in the RNLI ten years later he was made the youngest coxswain in the history of the RNLI and he uh, he served in that capacity for 16 years spending a total of 30 years as a volunteer in that organization uh, and that's him there Lee and I had the honor uh, last December to go to Penley and present on behalf of we were tasked by the Australian Volunteer Coast Guard to present a flag um, as a mark of our respect for what these men and the men that have gone before them uh, do on a daily basis and we were very very proud to do this we have to say there was the whole crew were there and there was also family of the, the men who had lost their lives that night um, we were a little bit nervous about going along um, there was a little bit of trepidation because these people knew that I did a presentation about their loved one about the, the Solomon Brown and we didn't know how they'd react to that so we were very happy and very relieved when um, during the ceremony uh, Patch Harvey who is the current coxswain and he's been the coxswain for 16 years and he's already done also done 30 years service he turned around and he was said he they were very very grateful uh, that the word of what had happened back in 1981 was still being told and that uh, they asked us to keep um, on giving these speaking presentations and uh, uh, then he turned around and he did something that surprised us uh, very much um, he gave us these he presented Lee and I with these t-shirts uh, which are cre crew t-shirts and they inducted us as honorary members of the Penley lifeboat sorry but some of the families were there as well and um, we, we didn't know how they would feel about things but once again um, they were very very grateful and, and their concern that as they pass on the story of the heroism of their loved ones will be lost as well so they made us promise uh, that no matter how, how hard this was we would continue to tell the story and as I said that's a promise we intend to honour <laughs> sorry um, yeah um, we also caught up with Neil Brockman um, lovely lovely guy great sense of humor um, he's got a very rich Cornish uh, accent he pr probably should come with subtitles uh, so you can understand him a bit better but he's a lovely lovely guy he is also extremely proud of his father and his ex-crewmates as, as well 
He told us a lot of stories about what had happened and previous rescues and things. And um, he's very, there were some things that didn't come out um, at the inquiry that he was able to tell us about, including he talked about his father. And he said that his father, and you can probably see from this photo, his father was one of those people that would walk into a room and light it up all immediately. He was one of those great humorous pe people that always had a laugh, on, a smile on his face and made people laugh. But he said that he was proud of his father because when his father's body was found, his arms were wrapped around the youngest girl, uh, trying to protect her to the very edge. I, as I said before, I avoided giving this presentation for a long, long time. And um, it's a small world. And um, back in early 2019, we were on a cruise on the Viking Sun. And I did, for some reason, I don't know why, there was actually no reason why I would do it, but I decided to give this presentation. And afterwards, a man came down to the front of the stage here, and he was very emotional, and he introduced himself as Richard Smith, the elder brother of the helicopter pilot, Russell Smith. You wouldn't read about it. Uh, he got a, a copy of, of the video from the wonderful production staff with, with Viking. He sent that to his brother Russell who, who contacted uh, uh, myself and Russell was able to give us a lot of information about what, was, uh, what happened that night. We plan to catch up with Russell um, and Richard in their hometown of Eugene, Oregon in April 2020, but obviously COVID hit and we couldn't go. But just before um, we arrived on the ship in LA back in early January this year, um, Viking uh, very generously flew Leanne and I to San Francisco. And uh, we spent four days there with the family, with Richard and Russell and their, their wives. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful time. And I just want a big shout out, thank you to the two ladies who organized the Viking Enrichment Program, Alison and Kelly, uh, for enabling this to happen. It was just a, a wonderful thing for them to do. And we, we had a lot of laughs and, and a lot of tears um, during that four days. There was a couple of nights where we stayed up to the wee small hours of the morning talking about things. Um, I've read through the, re the report of the inquiry several times and they go out of their way to praise uh, Commander Smith and Rescue 80 for their valour and for their skill and for their resolve that night. It goes to say that the report says that they went way beyond what any reasonable person would have expected them to do that night and that there was, given the conditions, there was nothing more that they could have done. And Russell knows that in his head. But he was saying that he has often, I mean, over the last 40 years, he often thinks, was there something else I could have done or could have said that might have changed things at all? Um, he has been to um, the town of the village of Mausel on a couple of occasions. He's met the family, he's met the, the lifeboat crew there. And he said that he always felt very welcome there, but not always very comfortable. Um, because of what had happened. But we were able to tell him that we've spoken to the families and they hold him in the highest regard. They have so much respect for him. Uh, they told us they feel a special bond with him because he was the last man to see, the last person to see their men alive and he was the person that was able to explain to them what happened on that night. So they're very, very grateful to him. And during the course of this four days, um, uh, Russell told us that, and um, his, his wife and brother and, and sister-in-law also confirmed that he hadn't talked about this, uh, this event. He talked more about this event in that four days than he had in the previous 40, day, 40 years. And the family now had a much better understanding of what he had been going through. And he felt that it was a cathartic experience for him as well which was, was great. Uh, and like I said, they're wonderful people. We hope to catch up with them again later this year, but we also uh, expect that we'll be lifelong uh, long friends. Now, the, the famous Mausel Christmas uh, Harbour Lights, at, uh, on the 19th of uh, December every year, the lights are turned off between the hours of 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. as a tribute, ongoing tribute to the men of the Solomon Brown. And I'd like to play you a video now. And this video was, was um, made by 
the families of the 16 people who lost their lives that night, uh, the families of, from bo the, both vessels, the Solomon Brown and the Union Star, have come together and they all support each other without any recriminations or anything like that, which is absolutely wonderful. And at the end of this video, you'll see um, an area that is a memorial area that's been uh, 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 made on the headland overlooking the cove where the, um, the disaster culminated on that night. And um, about halfway through the video, you'll hear a radio call from the Falmouth, Falmouth Coast Guard to the Penley lifeboat. Now, you'll probably be able to hear the despair and the resignation in the voice of the radio operator as he makes these calls. But he stayed at his post all night. He refused to be relieved by his colleagues. And he made this call more than 200 times. And after each call, he paused, waiting, hoping in vain that he would receive a response. So to me, he's another unknown hero. And after the video plays, I'm going to put up a, a, a quote from Winston Churchill, which describes the spirit of a lifeboat and the men and women who man these lifeboats. I won't be able to read it out, so I'm just hoping, I'm just asking that you would read it to yourselves. Too far from deadly rocks drifts Union Star. Captain Morton, his family and crew prayed for help as the storm winds blew. Lee St. Brendan, Lord of hosts, watch over those who work our coast. Protect them from the raging seas and give them love and life and peace. A sea king tried to weather the gale And lift them off to no avail From Penley Point came Solomon Brown Eight men aboard, no backing down Please St. Brendan, watch our coast Protect the ones we love the most Shield them from the raging seas and give them love and life and peace Pitched and tossed in mighty waves Great Dobbs and witches tried to save The stricken crew at any cost But every mortal soul was lost Cornwall morns in Christmas week For sixteen souls The families weep For Solomon Brown and her company And all those lost upon the sea Each Christmas now for those who died The lights of Mausel dim with pride For lifeboat crews who heed the call Who put to sea Give their all Please St. Brendan, Lord of hosts Watch over those who work our coasts Protect them from the raging seas And give them love and life and peace Please St. Brendan, watch our coasts Protect the ones we love the most Shield them from the raging seas And give them love and life and peace Please, St. Brendan, Lord of hosts Watch over those who work our coasts Protect them from the raging seas And give them love and life and peace
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. <laughs>